I think Cardano may have already fixed transaction fees. No pun intended. Ready? Let's go. Once again, the very brilliant Dr. Agalos Kiais of IOHK is explaining to us how Cardano intends to save the world. He dropped a nice article about the plan for fees and how to keep fees stable. And there's one point in the article that's a little bit confusing, but we're gonna, we're gonna explain it in a way that's really understandable, really simple, by referencing some information in another document. The problem that Cardano needed to solve has to do with the fact that blockchain assets serve two very different purposes. They serve as an investment that you sort of keep in your portfolio, and they also often serve as fuel for the transactions on that blockchain. We see this in both Bitcoin and Ethereum, infamously to the detriment of the user. Both blockchains are effectively unusable for small transactions because the transaction fees are so high. And this makes sense. What if driving a Tesla required you to burn Tesla stock to use it, right? Nobody would want to drive their Tesla. Well, why have fees at all? Why don't we just get rid of fees? Why don't we just have a zero fee blockchain? Because it does cost something to process transactions. In the case of Cardano, that those costs are often borne by the stake pool operators. So we have to we have to offset the stake pool operator costs somehow. We also have to prevent spam attacks, right? If somebody wanted to cripple a blockchain with no fees, it would be easy. You could, you know, perform the you know, kind of the equivalent of a DDoS attack by just spamming a huge number of transactions on an automated basis. You just push a huge number of transactions through the blockchain and you sort of cripple the blockchain because the blockchain is processing all these nonsense transactions. And we've actually seen that. We've actually seen that in the history of crypto with uh, sort of no fee or extremely low fee blockchain. So you need to have a fee just to prevent these spam type attacks. You also want to have a mechanism to incentivize transaction processors with higher fees for surge times to ensure quality of service. And I know that sounds a little bit scary because you're like, wait, are you saying that um, transaction fees are going to go really high just because the network's busy? That sounds a lot like what happens with gas fees on Ethereum, which nobody likes. We're going to explain that later. It's not the bad scenario. Professor Kiais is calling the Cardano solution stable fees. So this is a little bit complicated, but we're going we're gonna to explain it in a totally straightforward manner that you're going to understand. I think if you just read this article, there's a piece here that's a little bit complicated, but we're going to reference another document that's going to make even that piece straightforward. So stable fees involve a decentralized reserve contract that issues a stable coin pegged to a basket of currencies. Transaction fees on the Cardano network would be paid with this stable coin. ADA would be the reserve asset of the decentralized reserve contract, and it would still be the staking reward currency. So if the reserve contract experiences a liquidity crunch, then ADA will be used as a fallback currency. Don't worry, we're gonna explain that part. Transaction issuers would send ADA to the reserve contract to get something that Professor Kiais here is calling a basket equivalent coin. So the basket equivalent coin would be pegged to this, you know, basket of currencies or other assets. Uh, you would also be able to get equity shares in the reserve contract with ADA. And this is the mechanism by which the reserve contract would absorb price fluctuations in ADA to keep the stable coin stable. So that's a piece that isn't really explained in this article, but we're gonna jump over to another document to explain that exact item. Professor Kiais gave us a hint. He said, see also a USD stable coin system. So the system he's describing of ADA, a basket equivalent coin, any decentralized equity coin is this tri-coin system 
that's based on the way AGUSD works. And that explains to us the whole reserve system. So if you come to this document right here on the ergoplatform.org website, they explain exactly how this works, right? Different labels, their, uh, their reserve coins are the DECs of Professor Agalos' system. And, you know, obviously AGUSD is the, uh, is the BEC, the basket equivalent coin. So similar, similar tripartite system. So what happens is when you've got a stable coin, right? We want it to be, we don't want it to be like Tether where nobody knows how many assets actually underlie, you know, underlie the collection of Tether, right? The big fear of course, is that there aren't dollars backing tethers and that is you know strongly suspicion by pretty much everybody so we don't want that kind of system we want to have assets backing our stable coin that are equivalent to the stable coin the aggregate stable coin value right so how do you do this right you could hold a bunch of dollars and in a bank account somewhere and have to deal with all the stuff that early stable coins in the crypto space went through and that's basically banks not being willing to do that, right? Not being willing to hold dollars and you have to hold them somewhere. So it's kind of got to be a bank, right? So you say to yourself, okay, dollars, actual dollars is probably not the right way to do this. But if you back your stable coin with a cryptocurrency and you want it to be pegged to a fiat currency like dollars, you run into a problem because that cryptocurrency that's backing your stable coin that's pegged to fiat currency that cryptocurrency is going to fluctuate up and down and it's really hard to have the right amount of that crypt that cryptocurrency that reserve cryptocurrency right to equal the amount of stable coins so age usd and what professor uh Kiyas is describing is this really cool solution to that problem so what happens is you've got the dec here the reserve coins and this is like a speculative instrument, right? So when you have the DEC, the decentralized equity coin, you basically own equity in the reserve contract. You have like a percentage share of the assets in the reserve contract, right? So you buy this, you buy this DEC, this equity coin here, reserve coin, you buy that equity coin for a certain amount of ADA and the contract's going to give you back the equity coin and the equity, but the equity coin isn't a stable coin. You can't trade back in for that exact amount of ADA. It gives you a percentage share of the assets in the contract. So when people want to acquire the stable coin, the basket equivalent coin, the BEC, they are going to pay an amount of ADA. Right. And they're going to get a certain amount of that stable coin based on the value of ADA at the moment they buy the stable coin. But it's a stable coin. So when they go to trade the stable coin back in and to get ADA back for it, they want to have the fiat currency amount that the stable coin is supposed to represent. Right. So if they buy, you know, 10 bucks worth of the stable coin in february when they trade it back in in may they want to get 10 bucks worth of the stable coin but it's going to be an ada what they get in return and what they buy with is ada so the amount of ada they get is going to change but the fiat currency amount is going to stay the same this is a problem for your backed reserves of the stable coin right because if the price of ADA goes down, right? Let's say, you know, a whole bunch of users come in and they buy, you know, $500 million worth of the stable coin in February, but then by May, and so they're buying with ADA, right? So they put in $500 million worth of ADA into the reserve contract, but then by May, let's say the price of ADA has gone down. Now they're going to want to get 500 million bucks back, but there's not $500 million worth of ADA in the reserve contract. The amount of ADA in the contract didn't change. Nobody came in and like robbed any of that ADA, but the dollar value of the ADA in the contract changed. And since this is a stable coin, there wouldn't be enough ADA in the contract to 
allow all those stablecoin holders to trade their stablecoins back in and get the amount they're expecting, right? What like you know one dollar per per coin, or actually would be the you know the amount of the you know basket currencies. So the way they solve this is by having this other coin, right? Instead of just ADA and the stable coin, they have this other reserve coin, right? So that's a speculative asset. People are buying that with ADA, right? So now you've got additional ADA in the contract that doesn't correspond to the amount of the stable coin, right? There's there's additional ADA in the contract. It's no it's no longer just this one for one between the stable coins and the uh, the ADA. I'm talking in terms of like transactions, not the values. There's no longer this. There's like this additional amount that's beyond. There's an additional amount of ADA that's beyond the amount the stable coin holders use to acquire their stable coin, right? So you've got extra ADA now in the contract. And that's what Professor Kiyas means when he says, if the reserve contract experiences a liquidity crunch, then ADA will be used as a fallback currency, right? And that ADA, that fallback ADA in the case of liquidity, liquidity crunch, it's coming from these DEC holders, these decentralized equity coin holders. That's where that extra aid is coming from. So the stable coin holders will only be able to trade their stable coin back in for ADA if there's enough ADA in the contract in the contract. And the DEC or here reserve coin holders are the ones providing that extra ADA in case the price goes down. But here in this document, they wisely point out that holding the DEC holding the decentralized equity coin, this reserve coin, would be equivalent to having a leveraged long position in ADA because you own a percentage of the assets in the contract. So if the price of ADA goes way up, if the dollar value of the ADA that's in the contract goes up, then when the stablecoin holders come back to trade their stablecoins back in for ADA, they're just going to get the stablecoin amount, right? And the price of ADA has actually gone up. Now there's extra ADA in the contract that the stablecoin holders don't get to extract, right? It was like a bad trade by the stablecoin holders because they effectively traded their ADA for the right to recoup a, a liability, right? From the contract, the contract has this these like outstanding liabilities that's the amount that the stable hold, coin holders could trade their stable coins back in for. And the amount of the liabilities outstanding is lower than the amount of assets in the contract. So now there's extra ADA in the contract and these reserve coin holders, they don't, the liability to them isn't like X amount of ADA. It's like X percentage of the amount of ADA in the contract. So if the price of ADA goes up, they actually, would get back the ADA they originally put in and an additional amount of ADA, right? So they would get the appreciation of the ADA they actually put in and additional ADA on top of that because the stable coin holders made a bad bet. And of course, the opposite is true. If the price of ADA goes down, then that means the reserve coin holders made a bad bet and they're gonna get uh, a smaller amount of ADA because they just get a percentage share of the total assets in the contract. The cool thing though is this is a leverage long position where they don't get liquidated. If you've never used lever, if you're not, let's say if you're not familiar with leverage on crypto exchanges and elsewhere, the way it works is, you know, you're basically taking like a loan. And if the price, if you take a leverage long position and the price of that asset starts depreciating rapidly, the exchange gets afraid that you're not going to be able to repay the loan, right? Because they they see how much collateral is involved in the transaction, right? Collateral from you. And they're like, wow, it's depreciating too fast. He's He or she is not going to be able to pay back this loan. And they liquidate your position, meaning this makes people really mad in scenarios like flash crashes because they might have a leverage long position and then they get liquidated because the price drops very rapidly. And then the next day, the price is back up where it was before, but they already got liquidated. So they lost their entire their entire position there. So 
this is really interesting because with this tri coin system, at least the way the way Ergo has it laid out here with AGUSD, that wouldn't be the case. If you were a DEC or reserve coin holder and the price goes down, you just don't trade your decentralized equity coin back into the contract. You just hang on to it. You don't get liquidated. So if there's like a flash crash in the price of ADA or just a normal crash, you know, that lasts like a week, you know, if the price depreciates for a week, you could just ride it out. So this is kind of a unique, um, this would be kind of a unique instrument, you know, and, uh, you know, maybe a much, much better way to take a leverage long position in an underlying asset like ADA. Back to Professor Kiais's article, I'm not saying that's the way it's going to work out in Cardano or that that's anything that Professor Kiais is contemplating here, but he does say see also the AGUSD stablecoin design and that's something that it seems they're presenting about the AGUSD stablecoin design with the same exact tripartite, tricoin kind of structure. But Professor Kiais also points out that both the basket equivalent coin holders and the centralized equity coin holders could participate in staking and governance since both are actually priced in ADA. For instance, you could get staking rewards on your DECs or BECs, the stable coin or the reserve coin that would be paid in ADA. So you wouldn't necessarily even have to miss out on staking rewards by holding this stable coin or this reserve coin in the reserve contract. He takes some space in the article to explain how pricing of the assets in the baskets would take place. And of course, it's going to be an on-chain Oracle with geographically diverse Oracle contributors with on-chain trackable reputations, just like you'd expect from a project like Cardano. And then he explains how the transaction fee price formula would work. Like how do we determine how much a given transaction would cost the transaction issuer? And the components of the formula would be transaction size, computational requirements, and maybe some things like system load. And this would give you a base price guaranteeing that your transaction would be processed. And remember we said we were gonna talk about what happened in surge times, it's not the scary Ethereum gas fees scenario. In surge fees, you could just pay the base price, right? The cheap base price that guarantees your transaction will be processed. But if it's some crazy surge, you know, and there's a million people trying to tra uh, process their transactions, and you want it to happen faster. For some reason, whatever reason, idiosyncratically, you need that transaction to happen fast. You could go above and beyond the base price and pay 1.5 times the base price or three times the base price or et cetera for faster processing. So if you idiosyncratically value faster processing more than anybody else on the network, you could pay for extra for it and get it. But unlike Ethereum, there would be a base price that you don't have to guess at. The system would just tell you how much it would cost given your transaction size and the computational requirements of your transaction and maybe things like system load and you'd have that base price price you wouldn't have to like calculate gas fees and hope that you're right so one of the cool things about the system is that frequent transaction issuers could just store they could just store the the stable coin the basket equivalent coin to ward off increases in ada value right now where we have a fixed ADA value for transaction fees, it's kind of a problem because it was way cheaper to do transactions when Cardano was three cents than it is now above a buck 50, right? Per ADA because the fees are denominated in ADA and the price of ADA has gone up. So it'd be much better for frequent transaction issuers to just be able to grab some of the stable coin and know how much exactly they're gonna be paying uh, for their transaction fees, you know, at X point in the future, based on the value of that stable coin, which is not going to move with the value of ADA. So this is just an extension of Babel fees. If you think about it, Babel fees, which we've covered numerous times on this channel, uh, involve the idea that you could pay fees of Cardano native token transactions in those native tokens. Basically the stake pool operators, if they wanted to, would take your stable coins and they would pay your ADA fees for you in ADA in exchange for your stable coins. Uh, here, the reserve contract is kind of taking the place of the stake pool operator in the Babel, Babel fees system to do the conversion, to do that conversion for you. So this is totally compatible with Babel fees. And it's actually, you know, conceptually, it's kind of just an extension of that same idea. 
Also, this stable, stable fees idea is backwards compatible. They're not saying that you would have to go to this contract and get your hands on the stable coin, the basket equivalent coin to pay your fees. You could just pay them in ADA if you want to. If you don't care about the price of ADA going up, you could just pay your fees in ADA instead of the stable coin. So it's totally backwards compatible. Anybody who doesn't want anything to do with this reserve contract or the BEC could just pay in ADA like they do currently. There's also uh, an implement an idea that there could be an implementation of this idea that's being labeled stable fees light. You could just peg the price of the transaction fees to the basket of currencies, but then still pay the equivalent amount of ADA. So you could say like, okay, we're gonna have transactions cost 15 cents. The base price is always gonna be 15 cents. And then you just pay 15 cents every time, but you pay in ADA. Whatever ADA, whatever amount of ADA is worth 15 cents a day, you just pay in that amount. So it doesn't have to be this all or nothing thing. We can still have this sort of basket of currencies determining what the base price of a transaction is and just pay in ADA. So Professor Kiyas here is contemplating multiple, uh, multiple possibilities for this concept. But I think however they do it, it kind of fixes the whole the whole transaction fee problem we encounter with our, you know, asset, our speculative investment asset also being the fuel for the transactions. Again, this is a case of all of us involved in this ecosystem being smart for betting on the jockey, not the horse. And I will talk to you tomorrow.